All right, well, good evening. Welcome to our first evening lecture of 2021. My name is Trey Gaines, museum director, and we're glad to see you all this evening. I'm sure we've all been on a Zoom before, but before we begin, let me go over a few things for us. Uh, we are recording tonight's lecture and it will be available online soon. I've got everyone muted uh, right now uh, during the presentation, but and you're also welcome to keep your camera turned off if that's more comfortable for you. If you have questions, uh, feel free to type them in the chat box uh, to Lauren or Sarah. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can find them in the chat box and, and they will uh, keep all those and save them for the end. Or um, when Matthew's finished, I'll ask for questions and have you hit the raise your hand button at the bottom and I can unmute you and you can ask your question directly. Some brief announcements before we get started. Our temporary exhibit, Women of Bartow County, will close this coming Saturday. So if you haven't had an opportunity to come out and see that exhibit yet, I encourage you to come and check it out. Uh, that'll be up, like I said, through Saturday. We also wanna thank our exhibit sponsor, Century Bank of Georgia for helping uh, support that exhibit. Our next month's evening lecture will be on Thursday, February 25th at 7 p.m. Dr. Clarissa Myrick Harris from Morehouse College will be here to discuss the origins of the civil rights movement in Atlanta beginning in the 1880s. Uh, note that this will also be a, a Zoom only uh, event. We also at the museum have opened a new photograph exhibit called Faithful Companions. This exhibit uh, is in the main hallway of the museum. It's the photograph exhibit we change out once a year. This year, we've got 12 photographs of Bartow Countyans with their favorite uh, faithful companion or their dog um, for you to, to enjoy. And as part of that exhibit, we ask you to send us a photo of you and your faithful companion, be it a cat or, or a dog or some other furry animal. And we might share those with our followers on social media this year. And as a reminder, we are open. We're open Monday through Saturday, 10 to five and look forward to seeing you in the museum. All right, so our speaker tonight is Matthew Grambling. Matthew is a researcher with the Bartow History Museum and the Etowah Valley Historical Society. He is a Bartow County native and has had an interest in the history of the county since childhood. Matthew is an alumnus of Oglethorpe University, class of 2011 and Princeton Theological Seminary, class of 2015. He's also currently in the process of applying to several doctoral history programs in Georgia and Texas. And with that, I will hand it over to Matthew. Um, let's see, here we go. Matthew? All right then, are we ready? Right. Sounds great. All right, let me get to share everything. Uh, hold on, just give me one second, folks, I apologize. Minor technical difficulties. Sorry about this, Trey. That's all right. Uh, I just gotta go back. Here we go. Share screen. Here we go. And I think we're ready. All righty then. And if five. Right. Um. Hold on. One moment. If. And the words of uh, an individual I know who's in the audience. Technology is great when it works. <laughs> hold on. All right, there we go. All right, thank you very much everyone for joining me today. Uh, I really appreciate it a lot, uh, especially the friends and family that are here in the audience tonight. I, I greatly, greatly appreciate your attendance. Um, thanks for joining. It should be a really interesting topic. So let's just go ahead and uh, dive on in. Um, one thing before I dive in, I should say portions of this lecture were um, used in a prior article I did for the Etowah Valley Historical Society uh, called Pox and Pig Iron. Um, uh, a public health crisis in antebellum Bartow County, which you can find on the Bartow Authors page of uh, the Etowah Valley Historical Society. So in addition to the information, um, in addition to the material and media that the Bartow History Museum has, you can also go over there and check that out, uh, in addition to several other articles that I've written recently. So, uh, but I just thought I'd put that plug in there real quick. And now let's go ahead and dive in. Pox and pig iron, panic public health and smallpox prevention in antebellum upper Georgia. For three months in the spring of 1849, pestilence and panic gripped antebellum Bartow County. Smallpox had broken out of the Etowah Ironworks and threatened to infect the entire region unless swift action was taken to contain its spread. 
News of the outbreak spread rapidly throughout the state, triggering a wave of public fear, which caused trade and travel throughout Upper Georgia to come to a grinding halt. To meet this growing threat, municipal officials took decisive action by holding public meetings throughout the county in order to enact effective measures to prevent the disease from spreading to their communities. The sick were quarantined, temporary hospitals were established, weekly infections reports were published, and a vaccination campaign was vigorously promoted among the populace. The 1849 smallpox panic represents one of the first public health crises in the history of Bartow County and signifies a major public health action by municipal authorities across Upper Georgia. Local governments represented the central agents to the promotion of public health throughout the state. Town and city officials from the Coosa River to the Fall Line act as a vanguard against the panic by implementing definitive smallpox prevention policies. The panic also illustrates the ways in which the fear of smallpox influenced how 19th century Georgians perceived, confronted, and coped with the out outbreak of infectious disease in their communities. The popular reaction to the alleged presence of smallpox in upper Georgia towns and cities provides profound insight to the competition between miasma and contagion theories of disease in the Victorian American mind. Additionally, the panic deeply affected the economic behavior of antebellum Georgians by causing them to avoid major commercial centers and transportation networks, which were rumored to be in the grip of contagion. As such, it provides profound insight into the science and practice of Southern medicine in the late antebellum Georgia, Piedmont and upcountry. Here we go, first slide. The spring of 1849 marked a dramatic episode in the lives of Cass County denizens. In early March, a mysterious disease had made its appearance at the Etowah Ironworks and was generating intense public excitement among the citizens of the county. Rumors that the disease was smallpox began circulating widely among the populace. One report from the Augusta newspaper stated that nine cases had already occurred. As such, Mark Anthony Cooper, co-proprietor of the Etowah Works, was faced with a dilemma. To allow such reports to go unchecked would not only jeopardize the welfare of his workers, but also threaten the health of his business. Cooper responded by writing an open letter to J.W. Burke, editor of the Cassville Standard, disconfirming the rumors that smallpox, that disease was smallpox. He st stated that while several of his children had been ill with chickenpox just six weeks prior, he would gladly say that smallpox did not exist at the ironworks. To corroborate his report, Cooper included the medical opinion of Dr. W.H. Maltby of Cartersville. Maltby stated that he examined three of the reported cases, and of those cases, he diagnosed the first as a simple case of varicella or chickenpox, and the latter two as being very oiloid in appearance, but lacking the hallmark characteristics of smallpox. He also examined se several similar cases in Cartersville, which turned out to be only chickenpox. Thus, according to Cooper and Maltby, the ironworks were smallpox free, yet such good news proved too good to be true. For later in the same news brief, Burke included a postscript stating that just before going to press, the standard received a communication from a reputable gentleman stating that smallpox was indeed at the ironworks and that he had heard Dr. Slaughter of Marietta convince Maltby of his misdiagnosis. Burke closed his postscript by stating that from the sources made available to him, the standard felt compelled to inform the public that they believed it was genuine smallpox. While public opinion uh, accepted the news that, <clears throat> that the disease at the Ironworks was smallpox, Cooper remained incredulous. In a series of letters to Burke published throughout the first two weeks of April, Cooper attempted to cast doubt on the validity of the new diagnosis, even going as far as to question the medical experience of the examining physicians. He finally relented, albeit begrudgingly, due to the weight of public sentiment and the fact that cases began to terminate fatally. Even then, he only considered a, mo a modified or mild form of smallpox. Persuaded by Cooper's skepticism, several prominent newspaper editors concurred with his characterization of the disease. Though as the number of cases increased and more patients succumbed to the illness, they ceased to describe it in mild terms. One fatal case deserves particular attention. Mrs. Dunahoo, a young expectant mother who was stricken with smallpox and had to deliver her child with no medical aid. The community of Etowah at which, excuse me, 
at which the iron works were located represented one of the largest and most successful rural iron company towns in the lower south. Stretching for thousands of miles along the banks of Stamp Creek and the Etowah River, Etowah, or excuse me, thousands of acres, uh, Etowah employed about 75 white workers and dozens of white woodcutters, colliers, and artisans who kept the works in optimal production and the town bustling. The majority of the workforce had its origins in the South, yet a considerable portion had come from the major iron manufacturing centers of Europe, especially the British Isles. And thus, they represented the international character of the antebellum iron industry. Almost half of the white laborers were single young men living in close quarters around the Etowah furnace. As many as 23 resided in a single boarding house. Family housing was similarly concentrated. Thus, with smallpox being a classic disease of crowding, it comes as no surprise that when it broke out at the Etowah furnace, it spread so rapidly. The Dunahoos are among those European artisan families who, while coming to America for better opportunities, did not escape the ravages of old world disease. A family of Irish stonemasons, the Dunahoos were representative of the many British families who had come to offer their skills to the works at Etowah. Mrs. Dunahoo had married into the family shortly before, and when a smallpox break occurred, was heavily pregnant. Just before coming to full term, she contracted smallpox from her husband and went into labor in the throes of the disease. As she underwent the pangs of childbirth, Mr. Dunahoo lay in the same room, stricken with the contagion and still suffering under its effects. Smallpox could, could be particularly fatal to pregnant women, especially those entering their third trimester. Some studies of late 19th century cases suggest that the fatality rate for pregnant women with smallpox in their third trimester could reach as high as 50 to 80 percent. In addition to giving birth in the midst of illness, no medical assistance could be obtained because the fear generated by the smallpox panic had made any nurses and physicians reluctant to attend upon patients. Writing regarding Mrs. Dunahoo's case, Cooper states, the panic, was, has, the panic has deprived her, excuse me, has deprived her <clears throat> of everything a female should have in such cases. Uh, she is without doctor and without nurse. Mrs. Dunahoo successfully gave birth and appeared to be nursing well and in good health. If within a week she had tragically fallen victim to her illness. Uh, just, I wanted to pause real quick in case you guys um, didn't see these. This actually right here, uh, if you can see in the photo, if I have a laser pointer, one moment, please. Uh, here's a laser pointer. This actually right here is a map of the Etowah property from 1855. Uh, you can actually find it on the uh, Library of Congress website. And it has a number of um, most, I think the property in red is largely the, the, the property that's owned particularly by uh, Cooper himself. But as you can see, this is actually a pretty good map of what um, the Etowah River looked like before the dam was built, a number of different ways. And where the outbreak was particularly concentrated, we right up here along Stamp Creek. Um, there's a marina there now, and I can't remember the name of the campground that's over in that area. Uh, but that was, that's principally the epicenter of the, uh, the outbreak. Uh, so I just thought I'd share that with you guys for one moment. So here we go. Uh, here we go. And... And this right here also is the Stroop Furnace. Um, now it's currently underwater. Um, the Etowar Stroop Furnace, which is, was the furnace where, around which the outbreak mainly took place. So and I think this picture may be contained at the Bartow History Museum or in another, um, uh, maybe at EBHS as well. So, all right, back to the lecture. Uh, smallpox was a dreaded and loathsome disease to antebellum Americans. A member of the orthopox family of virus or variola, uh, smallpox, excuse me, a member, a member of the orthopox family of virus, smallpox or variola was a highly infectious disease spread through direct physical contact with the sick or through inhaling the airborne droplets of an infected person. An individual infected with smallpox would experience a high fever and a distinctive progressive skin rash, which formed pea sized pitted pustules in the epidermis. These pustules would crust over forming scabs, which would eventually fall off, often leaving deep pock marks in the skin. This could result in permanent disfigurement, especially to the face, which commonly bore the greatest number of lesions. There was also a significant chance that the individual could be left blind from the disease. And in both cases, that was if the patient survived. The mortality rate 
for smallpox was about 30%. Thus, it was a source of great public alarm whenever it made an appearance. There are numerous anecdotes of physicians and compassionate gentlemen undertaking the care of smallpox victims only to be driven forth from, the com from communities by terrified and enraged town folks. One account relates the tragic case of a smallpox stricken Georgia wagoner who was obstructed in his way by local residents and forced to take shelter in a barn where he lay neglected and dying. Uh, he was buried with the same concern as shown him in illness. The barn in which he lay dead was torched and burnt down upon him by the same local citizens who had driven him thence. Simultaneously, simultaneous with the iron works outbreak, smallpox also made an appearance in Atlanta. A.M. Herring, a Florida merchant on a return trip from New York, had been exhibiting symptoms similar to smallpox when he had checked into the Atlanta hotel. He was then examined by several physicians who concluded that he had indeed contracted smallpox. Uh, Georgia, uh, uh, excuse me, news of an, of an occurrence of smallpox in Atlanta compounded the existing alarm in Northwest Georgia over the Cass County outbreak and initiated a statewide wave of rumor and panic. Erroneous reports began to circulate that smallpox was simultaneously prevailing in Macon, Augusta, Griffin, Kingston, Aurora, Marietta, Athens, and Rome, keeping local newspaper editors busy disconfirming such reports. Some editors had to falsify uh, had to falsify rumors circulating in newspapers as far away as Montgomery and Boston. In Athens, alleged smallpox reports had generated considerable anxiety and apprehension among Franklin College students and their parents. As a result of this panic, trade and travel throughout the upper portion of the state came to a grinding halt, especially along the route of the Western Atlantic Railroad in Northwest Georgia. The 1849 Chief Engineer's Report demonstrates a considerable decline in freight and travel income totals from March to May, which is the duration of the panic. Similar declines in monthly receipts were reported by the Macon and Western Railroad Company and the Georgia, and the Georgia Railroad Company. An extract from a cotton report, uh, an extract from a cotton report for 1848 to 49, published in the September issue of the Atlanta Intelligencer displays a marked drop in the number of cotton belt shipped from the Georgia Railroad Depot in Atlanta. From March to the end of May, the number of bales shipped from the depot plummeted from 2,040 to 358. Uh, the editor of the Atlanta Intelligencer commented the amount of cotton received at this market would greatly have exceeded the amount reported above had no case of smallpox occurred in our town. The reader will receive in the monthly receipts a great falling off just, as the, just at the time that the few cases of smallpox occurred. Smallpox rumors also had detrimental effects upon a city's merchants who, who, excuse me, whose businesses suffered greatly because the, travel, the travelers and patrons uh, uh, were, because travelers and patrons were apprehensive about visiting the city. Uh, several newspaper editors ascribed the rumors to ascri ascribe the rumors to malicious parties who had carefully crafted them to in, to the excuse me uh, to injure the trade of their respective cities and benefit their commercial rivals. The editor of the Macon Journal and Messenger went as far as to attribute the source of the rumors to roving bands of peddlers who had infested the countryside. They claimed that they had received reliable reports that the country was teeming with peddlers who were spreading false reports of the appearance of smallpox in Macon, Griffin, and other cities. Their aim was to circumvent trade from honest local merchants to themselves, thus swindling the public by selling them inferior wares for exorbitant profits. Regarding the cotton report for the Georgia Railroad Depot, the editors of the Atlanta Intelligencer asserted that the rumors circulating around the severity of the smallpox outbreak caused such alarm among those who would normally bring their cotton to Atlanta that they went to other markets. Griffin profited most from this reallocation of commerce, but cities like Macon, Athens, Columbus, and Montgomery received their share of the trade lost by Atlanta. The editors also claimed that the rumors were meticulously crafted for the purpose of subverting and supplanting Atlanta's markets. They state, 
Many who cont contemplated bringing their cotton here became so much alarmed by the exaggerated reports assiduously calculated to our prejudice that they have turned their teams in another direction and carried their cotton to other markets. Griffin profited more than any other town by our loss, but Athens, M Macon, Columbus, and Montgomery received each of their, them a portion of the trade which we lost by, our, by the unfortunate occurrence. I just want to pause here real quick. Um, this is actually a really wonderful painting. Um, John Etten Anniger did this, and uh, it kind of uh, portrays the stereotype of the typical Yankee peddler that you would have found in ad the antebellum South this time. So you, I'm sure many people probably know the, uh, the concept or the motif of the carpetbagger. Well, these people were essentially the great grandfathers of the carpetbagger. Um, they would kind of came down to the South to sell different wares and other things and this and that and knickknacks. Um, uh, down throughout much of the South. So another, I don't, there's a, there's a possible sectional jab uh, going on um, with these editorial comments as well that these Yankees have come down here and they're spreading malicious lies and rumors um, and they're subverting our good, honest Southern tradesmen. Um, so there's a possibility there's a bit of that uh, in these comments as well. So uh, in order to meet the threat of, con of contagion and assuage public excitement, Town and city officials had to act quickly. Town commissioners and county magistrates represented the central agents in the protection of the health of their citizens, citizenry throughout the state. They were solely responsible for enacting preventative measures and making preparations for the care of the afflicted. With no method of treatment, most medical approaches to combating smallpox focused on preventing its introduction, inhibiting its spread, and providing for the care and comfort of the sick. Smallpox prevention in Upper Georgia mirrored as well as had its origins in the colonial public health laws of major low country port cities like Savannah and Charleston. Developing out of maritime quarantine law, typical methods of smallpox prevention in Upper Georgia consisted of quarantining patients a safe distance outside of a community, prohibiting contact with infected locales, the destruction of infected clothing and the immediate and careful internment of the dead. State law empowered city councils and county inferior court justices with the authority to establish temporary hospitals for the sick, supply patients with the necessary subsistence and medical care, and post a guard to prevent contact with the infected and their attendants. At the, at the Iron Works, Cooper and his staff attempted to implement such a policy to the best of their abilities. In order to contain the disease and expedite its departure, Infected cases and those who had come in contact with them were quarantined. Communion with the sick was also restricted, yet due to the lack of medical staff, Cooper had to provide for their care. In the case of Herring in Atlanta, he was quarantined a mile without the city at a temporary hospital. The city council also passed a series of resolutions to prevent the further spread of the disease, as well as, to, as took proactive measures in case it should make an appearance. They also commissioned physicians to undertake vac a vaccination campaign of the populace. Other municipalities throughout the state took similar preventative steps. In Cassville, local officials held a meeting in order to enact effective policies of keeping the disease out of the town, preventing contact with infected districts and establishing temporary hospital accommodations and ardently promoting vaccinations of its citizens. And all right, just a brief pause. So some of you can see this is a um, small illustration of a Victorian smallpox tent. So you would likely have someone like a nurse who would either had or a, a physician who would likely either had smallpox or received the smallpox vaccination and they would be attending on various um, uh, various patients in different stages of the disease. Um, so there we go. All right. Smallpox vaccination had existed since 1796 when the English physician Edward Jenner had discovered that administering the much milder cowpox virus greatly reduced the potency and lethality of smallpox cases, if not granting complete immunity to the recipient of the vaccine. Vaccine matter was procured through the collection and processing of scabs or vaccine crusts from cowpox pustules of naturally or deliberately infected cows and calves. Such bovine hosts provided the purest and best sources for vaccine material. The vaccination procedure consisted of a relatively simple operation whereby particles of vaccine matter were inserted under the skin of the arm through a prick or scratch from a small needle. 
While usually effective, quality control of vaccine matter could sometimes be problematic. In an age before modern medical storage techniques, vaccine material had a short shelf life. This caused considerable difficulties in transportation of vaccines, especially over long distances. On some occasions, vaccine matter would prove entirely ineffective and thus necessitate obtaining the attaining of fresh material and a readministration of vaccines. Two such occur occurrences took place in casts during the panic. During the first weeks of the outbreak at the Ironworks, Mark Anthony Cooper procured a supply of vaccines for the vaccination of Etowa and its environs. Unfortunately, the vaccine matter was apparently of poor quality or degraded during shipment and thus proved ineffectual. Cooper responded by making a public appeal to any physician with a fresh supply to send the vaccines to the ironworks. Similarly, chief engineer of the Western Atlantic Railroad, William L. Mitchell, vaccinated his employees at the first news of the smallpox in Cass. As the vaccine matter proved useless, a new supply had to be obtained and readministered, and it was readministered with positive results. Such occasions sometimes compounded any suspicion or uncertainty regarding the effectiveness of vaccination for smallpox that remained in the public mind. The use of folk remedies and medicines persisted among significant portions of the population of the American South, especially Southern Appalachia. Two particularly popular medicines uh, used, folk medicines used during the, pan the smallpox panic were asafetida and pine tar. Asafetida was a gum or resin made from the roots of several Near Eastern plants and sold in small bags to be worn around the neck or fill one's pockets, the pockets of one's garments. These asafetida bags were used as a noxious aromatic charm, which, were, which was believed to ward off disease, especially during the winter months. Uh, the logic being that the fetid smell will keep away illness. Pine tar was believed to work similarly, but decocted into a salve and smeared directly on the nose. It also possessed mild antiseptic qualities. Both of these folk remedies had their bases in a widely held medical belief at the time known as miasma theory, which attributed the spread of disease to the presence of poisonous vapors or miasmas caused by decomposing matter and which infected the air around a community. Contemporaneous with miasma theory was the rival contagion theory, which postcided that instead of originating an illness inducing noxious contaminated air, disease was caused by an infectious agent usually transmitted by personal contact. While miasma theory was predominant throughout much of the antebellum era, by the mid 19th century, it was gradually being eclipsed by contagion theory. This competition and transition between two theories of disease is evident in the smallpox panic, especially at the ironworks. In his open letters on the state of the outbreak at the Etowa furnace, Cooper had to address speculation regarding the introduction of the disease into the community. Rumors circulated throughout the first two weeks of the outbreak the disease had been brought to the ironworks by a northern or western man. Cooper dismissed these reports stating that the disease here must be of atmospheric origin and not come, have come by contagion. His dismissal of contagion and post at of atmospheric origin of the disease demonstrates that Cooper interpreting the opening events of the outbreak through the lens of miasma theory. Yet within a week, as evidence mounted that smallpox was indeed at the, at the works, Cooper abandoned his miasma hypothesis and began a diligent search for the source of the contagion. While the search proved fruitless, it demonstrates that the events of the outbreak convinced Cooper of the credibility of contagion theory. And just to briefly pause, some of you may be able to see, um, some folks here, depending on where you grew up, if you grew up in Appalachia, you may uh, remember some of these. They were called asafetida bags or asafetida bags. And kids, um, especially in the 50s, even up to the 50s, would still wear these as a charm against colds and other diseases and uh, things like that. But as you can see right here, this is a, uh, a pretty good example of an asafetida bag right here. And this is kind of what asafetida would look like in its natural state. And here are some, some uh, pi a pine cell that you can see. All righty then. While some elements of the population were reticent regarding the effectiveness of vaccination and smallpox prevention, many found the evidence to be conclusively in its favor. Physicians, politicians, and editors weighed heavily on the side of vaccination and encouraged the public to be vaccinated. Vaccination of infected districts was even a part of official state policy in Georgia. State law mandated that the governor was to store vaccine matter 
at various convenient locations throughout Georgia, as well as to furnish it to the people gratis. While the governor supplied vaccine matter in many cases, vaccination was still principally a local affair under the administration of municipal and county authorities. Towns and cities across the state undertook initiatives to vaccinate their residents, <clears throat> excuse me, to vaccinate their residents, uh, both black and white, free of charge through contracting the services of trusted local physicians who established vaccination clinics throughout various municipal wards or county districts. Occasionally, the state could not provide sufficient vaccine matter and local authorities had to seek an out-of-state supply. During the smallpox panic, demand for vaccine matter was so high that it actually exceeded uh, the state's ability to effectively supply it. Dr. Tomlinson Fort, one of the leading medical lights of Antebellum, Georgia, issued a notice in the newspaper stating that the high volume of applications for vaccine material had out outstripped the state supply and recommended that anyone who desired to obtain vaccine supplies should procure them from the Janerian Vaccination Institute of Maryland, from which that genuine vaccine crusts may be obtained by mail at $1 each. It's kind of interesting, a dollar for a scab, that's, uh, that's kind of highway robbery. <laughs> but uh, in addition to promoting, uh, uh, in addition to promoting vaccination, boards of health were appointed by county inferior courts throughout Georgia to confront the smallpox spread. These in turn published weekly reports providing statistics regarding rates of infection recovery and death. In Cass County, the inferior court established a board of health chaired by Cooper himself. These weekly reports demonstrated a considerable infection rate throughout the month of April with 10 to 20 new cases occurring at the Ironworks every week. By the time the spread of the disease had been arrested in early May, there had been 110 total cases with five deaths at the Ironworks and three cases which all survived in Cartersville. On May 18th, the board published its final report with the physicians of the board giving the county a clean bill of health. The concerted and quarantine and vaccination efforts of the citizens of Cass and their leaders had yielded full fruition. Smallpox had disappeared from the county. Shortly after, news surfaced that Atlanta was smallpox free and by the beginning of June, it could be stated that the disease was present nowhere in the state. The scourge had finally run its course and for the time being, the people of Cass and Upper Georgia needed not fear the speckled monster. By the end of the summer, life had returned to a state of normalcy and merchants looked hopefully upon the prospect of good business in the fall. Excuse me, pardon me folks, uh, wrong way, there we go. Yet the effects of the panic were still deeply felt by some in Cass. In his annual address before the biennial assembly or biennial session of the Georgia General Assembly in November, Governor George W. Towns brought to the attention of the legislature uh, the great public expenditure, public anxiety, and destruction to business which a portion of the citizens of Cass County had suffered during the attack of smallpox on their communities. He also, reminds, he also reminded them of the precedent set by previous legislatures in providing for the relief of such afflicted counties from the state treasury. In accordance to that, in December of, in December of that eight, the same year in 1849, Cass County Representative William T. Wofford introduced a bill requesting the appropriation of $2,170 for the expenses occurred from co combating the scourge of smallpox in Cass County. The bill and its attendant papers were then sent to a committee of finance, which was chaired by George D. Phillips of Habersham County. After reviewing the relevant documents, Phillips reported unfavorably regarding defraying the expenses. And in, in uh, <clears throat> uh, defraying the expenses in the treatment of smallpox cases in the county. In February 1850, action on the bill was postponed several times before the House before it went into com the Committee of the Whole, where the bill was effectively and indefinitely, uh, uh, excuse me, pardon me. Uh, I, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, of the whole where the bill was postponed indefinitely by Edmund B. Gresham of Burke County, effectively killing it, killing it for that legislative session. Another attempt to produce relief or to procure relief was made by the following session of 1851 to 52. On November 14, 1851, William H. Felt presented a petition to the House from the Cass County Inferior Court regarding the money they expended in arresting the spread of smallpox. 
Felton then motioned for the petition to be referred to a special committee composed of J.D. Bellinger of DeKalb, William T. Wofford of Cass, and himself also of Cass. No further mention of the petition appears in the House Journal, and thus it appears to have died in committee. This was not an uncommon practice for the antebellum legislature. Lumpkin County made a similar appeal for smallpox relief, especially with the payment of guards, uh, which also came to naught during the 49th session. In 1843, the General Assembly had passed an act repealing a prior law, which required the state to defray expenses occurred on account of smallpox. Such acts and demonstrated that except in rare circumstances or extraordinary individual cases, the state viewed the cost of public health, especially smallpox prevention, as being principally a matter of municipal and county responsibility. There we go. The smallpox panic of 1849 represents one of the most dramatic and affecting episodes in the history of public health in Bartow County. It provides a superb window into the history of medicine in antebellum Georgia and a, and a profound demonstration of the way Cass County citizens respond to the threat of deadly contagion in their nests. As such, it demonstrates the critical role local governments had in promoting public health measures throughout the state, especially regarding smallpox prevention. The panic also illustrates the ways in which 19th century Georgians perceived, confronted, and coped with the outbreak of infectious disease in their communities. The popular reaction to the alleged presence of smallpox in upper Georgia towns and cities demonstrates the manner in which Victorian Georgians interpreted respond, and responded to infectious disease medically, culturally, and economically. Through the efforts of town commissioners and county magistrates across the state, the smallpox outbreaks were contained, public excitement allayed, and interstate economies were stored, and the foundations of modern public health policy in Georgia were established. During Reconstruction, Bartow County officials would establish a central quarantine and treatment facility at the Bartow County Poor Farm at what is today known as Hickory Log Personal Care Home. Smallpox cases would often be transferred to the Poor Farm where a, smallpox, uh, where a smallpox hospital would be established for the duration of the patient's illnesses. This hospital would often be set up in one of the Poor Farm buildings or a special triage and quarantine tent. Nurses and physicians would be hired to care for the smallpox patients and be paid from the county treasury. During the current COVID-19 health crisis, pondering the history of past health crises can provide Bartow County residents with a moment of pause and inspiration and reflecting upon the ways in which our forebears suffered, coped, and persevered in the face of lethal contagion. And thank you all for joining me. And that's the end of the lecture. So uh, just one other thing real quick. Here's an appendix. Um, which provides a timeline of the cases for smallpox at the Etowah Ironworks, Cartersville, and Atlanta. As you can see, it gradually goes up. Um, and uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you, Matthew. That was very interesting. Um, I will open it up to questions. If you have questions, indicate that to me through, either through the chat or through uh, raising your hand with the little raise your hand button at the bottom. Um, let's see, okay, we have a question here. Jan, I'm trying to unmute you here. Oh, Matthew, can you um, unshare your screen for me real oh, quick? Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, for some reason, it's not letting me unmute. Sorry hmm. about that. Hold on. Matthew, while I try to figure this out, tell us a little bit about how you got uh, into inter uh, interested in researching this topic. Um, trying to, I, it's been, I started almost uh, 
six months ago or more now, and I almost I almost can't remember how I actually got involved with it. But I I think it uh, let me think what really inspired. I think well actually what how it happened really I was going through um, many of the newspapers that are kept on. If anyone doesn't know this, there's it's actually a really great resource. Galileo has a um, a number of uh, a collection which has pretty much newspapers for almost every Georgia county uh, that's available online going all the way back to the colonial era. I mean, it's unbelievably fantastic. And I was just looking for stuff. Um, actually, I was, I was looking for stuff regarding uh, just the history of Cassville and Cass County. And I just stumbled upon this. I was going through maybe like the, the decade for the 1840s. And I just stumbled upon this uh, reference to a smallpox panic. And uh, I just sucked me in because the more and more I read about it, um, it matched up to a number, had a number of similar, or had a number of formal similarities, the current health crisis. And uh, throughout this process of, of writing this and uh, getting ready even for this lecture, um, and just a couple of weeks before, um, you know, there have been a number of really peculiar moments of deja vu. Uh, you know, you can find a lot of different patterns um, with the way people respond to infectious disease and how people, uh, how people respond with public health initiatives. I mean, even just uh, a couple of weeks ago, the governor, um, Governor Kemp was talking about uh, issues with, uh, you know, the supply of getting COVID-19 vaccinations. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, this sounds very familiar, you right. know? Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, that's kind of inspired my interest. I, uh, I had the pleasure of talking to Peter McCandless, um, who was a well-known expert on this field who wrote, uh, um, slavery, disease, and suffering in the, in the South and the Southern Low Country, and he was an immense help, and uh, also really kind of inspired in, in my interest in pursuing it as well, because uh, smallpox has not been written on very much in Georgia, uh, and he's one of the few people who actually write about um, tropical, the effect of tropical diseases in the South and the Southern Low Country in, in the past decade. Very interesting. You had a lot of great sources too. Did you have a difficulty finding resources to pull your information from? Uh, some, in some ways, yes. Um, it was a lot easier than what I expected. Um, I, the, the most difficult thing I had with was actually procuring, uh, because that's actually the, the diff most difficult thing I had was procuring books uh, because many of the uh, university libraries are closed or rather closed to outside people. So uh, trying to, um, you know, and having the patience for, to get an ILL through your local library sometimes can be a little difficult when you're on a deadline. Um, but that was kind of the most difficult thing I had, but there was a surprising amount of information uh, out there about it. Um, I probably should uh, give a shout out to Mel Mary Hilpertsauer, who is the, uh, uh, I believe she's the, uh, the archivist, if I'm not mistaken, at the uh, CDC Museum, who uh, was immensely helpful in, uh, in helping me find resources and uh, coming to uh, understand the nature of smallpox, which, I mean, it's technically been dead for almost, you know, it's been, it's been dead as a threatening disease for like 40 years now. So, um, so she was an immense help with that. Mm -hmm. Anyone else, any questions? Um, I'm gonna give you all the opportunity to unmute yourselves. If you have a question, just go ahead and um, unmute yourself and you ought to be able to ask that question or raise your hand in the box. Was uh, for future president uh, John Adams up in Massachusetts, maybe Boston, didn't he take the vaccination to show, Jenner's vaccination to show uh, that it was safe? I believe he did, but I also, I know more of the case of Thomas Jefferson who I believe actually personally administered it himself um, to a number of people, I think in and around the community around uh, uh, Monticello and et cetera. But he wrote rather, he was a vigorous proponent and supporter of a Janarian vaccination. So there are actually a lot of really amusing cartoons from the 1790s of that era where people, uh, your, your typical kind of anti-vaccination cartoons where people uh, had assumed that if they uh, took the vaccine, they would start turning into cows uh, because it was a cop punk spire. <laughs> so if you look online, you can actually look up, you, you'll find that very easy when you talk about gender and vaccination. You'll see these really peculiar Georgian, uh, I think these would be called Georgian cartoons, political cartoons talking about vaccination and 
the potential risks of it and et cetera. So yeah, uh, but mainly I'm more familiar with Thomas Jefferson's, you know, very strong support of it, but I'm pretty sure Adams may have also done considerable work up in Boston as well um, and around that time, so yeah. I think that's really interesting because I mean, that's something that you see happening today where you have political mm -hmm. figures publicly taking the vaccine to show their support. Yeah. But also even like in the, I remember when the polio vaccine first came out, there's that famous picture of Elvis getting the vaccine yeah. to mm -hmm. let people know that it's safe. So I think it's cool that we see that recurring through history. And I think the fact that you can look back and find instances like this, it helps people stay calm during times like- Yeah, absolutely. Now to know that we've done this before, we've seen this before, and we ultimately end up recovering. I think that's that's a really cool. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and, and to, to address what you said, that's part of the reason I did it. I think I wrote it, and it's one of the comforting things, um, as you mentioned about it, was, you know, I mean, uh, other people, not and not myself, other researchers, um, you know, uh, Joe Head did a, a similar article on uh, Spanish flu when the outbreak just first came out. So, I mean, Bartow County residents have gone through the ringer with disease. Uh, one of the things I should mention that's actually contained within the Bartow County archives that has been recently digitized and uh, uh, are a number of um, papers regarding the treatment of smallpox throughout the 1870s and 80s. Trey may be able to address that more, um, but yeah, those are, uh, there are, there are plenty, of, um, there's plenty of information that's contained about that within um, the historical institutions here. And it's really, it's, it's interesting, it is comforting to see that, uh, that Bartow Countyans have uh, pulled through uh, things like this. And in some cases, you know, I mean, COVID is a serious thing, but uh, you know, some cases we've pulled through even more serious uh, um, contagions and diseases. I think uh, George Washington as a young, younger man before he was General George Washington or President Washington. I think he had smallpox because it seems like I read that uh, he had. Yeah, I believe you're right. Yeah. Places where he had had. I, I believe I read too that he actually still had some scars from him as well, right. even when he was uh, when he was a general. Um, I think he got it as a relatively young man, uh, roughly around, if I'm not mistaken, well, roughly around the time he was participating in the, maybe a little before he was participating in the uh, French and Indian War uh, in the 1760s. I think he got it sometime in the 1750s, but yeah, that would, uh, uh, that, that does sound very familiar. All right, any last questions? I tell you, we all think of, um, hold our doctors and our nurses and our medical professionals in high regard um, your description of how they created the vaccine and, and, and you know, had to, to collect <laughs> yes. scabs and things, that just takes it to a whole new level. Yeah, well, one thing I, I thought I'd address that real quick is, um, and I hope that never happens at the Bartow History Museum or anywhere else, people continue to find uh, like small cop scabs from people uh, and from animals, uh, but mainly people. I mean, the, there's a case in the Virginia Historical Society where they had found one, they put it on display and the CDC had to come up and irradiate it to make sure that it wasn't, um, oh, wow. that it had no, had no, you know, uh, uh, no. it was minimal risk, but there was no, that there was absolutely no chance it could cause any kind of, but I mean, people continued to have that, but they would, people who survived it would send these scabs home so that their families would have a ready supply just in case. <laughs> wow. I mean, uh, I mean, those, those were not necessarily the safest vaccine crusts, but uh, yeah, and there's, as, there's plenty of cases of uh, uh, postbellum portraits of uh, uh, doctors and physicians, and they have a line of people going up, and there's a cow sitting right there, and they're scraping these scabs off, this udder and stuff, um, and this infected cow, and they're scratching in the arms of people, so yeah. yeah I can say we, we have some pretty odd things in our collection, but we don't have any scabs. Thankfully, thankfully we don't. <laughs> We if do we have, have some human hair. Please don't make me touch them. Yeah, yeah. Let's please know. <laughs> right. All right. Um, well, Matthew, thank you so much for being here and, and sharing that with us. We appreciate it and, and um, applaud your, your research and your efforts here. We appreciate that what you've done for us. Well, thank you very um, much, Trey. I want to thank you all for being here this evening. And, and, and uh, if you want to send Matthew a, a quick message in the chat, do so, or uh, let him know that you appreciate his being here.
I do encourage you to uh, check out his, his other research uh, materials. He's Like you said earlier, he's got a number of, of other things and articles at the EVHS website. Uh, so check those things out. He's got some, um, some, great, some great research and articles there. I will say that um, some of you will receive a short survey this evening to uh, uh, go along with this, this presentation. We'd like, appreciate it if you take a minute to respond to that to help us make some necessary adjustments or improvements to how we present these Zoom, uh, Zoom opportunities for you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, real soon, either here uh, virtually or in the museum. Thank you all for being here and good night.